Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of the Salt Mine. My name is Gordo. I'm Nyarko. And I'm TDS. Yay. And we're keeping it small this week. We've got it down to just three people. I think this is the first step of this becoming like a game show where whoever has the worst takes gets voted off every week. We lost Slayer after week one, and now we lose Bonfire for week three. They'll they'll be back in the future, though, as tribal council. Uh, but until Wait, you're then... right. It's been one off for both weeks. Like, exactly one has gone away. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's, eventually it'll be down to just me. Uh, I think I've got the best uh, predictions so far, but yeah, I was gonna say I can't be that systematic because for some reason I'm still allowed on the podcast, even though I think that I've been inting it verbally every single week regarding my takes. It's strategic. It uh, <laughs> it's just about how it works out. All right, but with that said, uh, excited to get into episode three here. Been fun week. Got sixteen more or. Yeah, 16 more series uh, to have been played. And I want to keep it to opening up the episodes with Player of the Week. So let's let's nice. chat about our Player of the Week candidates a little bit first and foremost. Uh, who do you guys have following uh, this week's performances? Well, you see, I'm in a little bit of a predicament here because my one good take was that I had Aminas as my top player last week, and I don't think that's changed at all. C9 Challengers, I think, are looking like one of the best teams, if not the straight-up best team in the league right now, and I think Aminas is a huge part of that. I'm going to keep riding that train until it stops giving me money. Thanks, sir. That's a fair choice. I, I thought Aminas definitely had a really impressive week. His Akali in particular, man, that blows me away a little bit i don't it's weird because i normally don't have like really mechanic specific takes like this um uh and, and you know maybe maybe it's uh maybe it's a little bit of bias or something but his akali it's just it the 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 speed with which he executes and the like deliberate nature of everything he does on that champion just really does look like a level above not only most of the akalis in the league but like most of the akalis I see in professional play period he just everything is so purposeful everything is so precise uh and you know it it doesn't always win him the game see i think he lost in a Kali game this week but it's very flashy and it's very impressive korean mechanics dude that's that's the biggest thing it's a korean mechanic but it's also young korean mechanics so it's even better because you know that they are going to be good he can't, even though he's not no longer practicing with Chobi, Showmaker, those good mid laners, he's still being able to perform to a high level. And I do agree, I think, probably looking like the best player overall, period, in the league, I think. No, not only the fact that he is looking like the main carry of the number one team also in standings, but in, in way of playstyle. But I, I feel like more so than that, he I don't think he has lost a lane. Even playing Akali, I don't think he loses lanes. And that's something that feels like so hard to consistently do. Even if you're a better player, you're still there. Sometimes that it's hard to try and be able to consistently win those lanes. But I think MNS has done such a good job at not only win the games, but win the lanes against certain opponents. And it's looking week by week, like he's going to end up being the better player. I take it another step. I love looking at mid laners, obviously. I'm a huge mid laner fan, and I'm still high on a lot of the other mid laners. Obviously, APA is still looking really good to me. Maybe not to the caliber that I was expecting, but looking good. But I want to shout out Shaden. I think looking like one of the better players in EG, especially now that they kind of come back, shaking up some things, trying to repurpose themselves to try and put themselves higher in the league. I think Shaden has been having massive performances, and I'm liking what he's showcasing with EG team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Shaden's my player of the week, hands down. Um, I think a, a fantastic week from him. They lose their first game of the week coming out, uh, and he just says, you know, screw this, guys. Soul's underperforming. I've got two substitute players in both carry positions. Pick me carry junglers every game. And they do it, and he gets double-digit kills every game and just hard carries, rattles off five NACL wins in a row 
uh, a bunch of them on Viego. Yeah. He has like a Graves in there and a Kindred in there as well. And just every performance was just terrific. He just has this way of finding angles. And it's crazy that like even once teams start to figure it out and they're like, okay, we're not going to let Robbie Bob play Galio. You know, we're going to we're going to make him play Kindred with Sejuani top like stuff that doesn't even make sense. And it still ends up being super successful for Shaden. I mean, he's even though I still think Amanis is the best player in the league, Shaden is my player of the week for sure. And I think that's a really good take because it brings me to a point that I've been kind of observing in the league right now, which is I think that the continuity of top jungle is mattering less than just straight up how good your top is and how good your jungle are separate from one another. And really, I think a lot of the time these games, especially this week, are defined by their junglers. Yuji is someone else who stands out to me as just a very consistent player with a lot of just really, really fantastic calls under their belt. But I do think that if we are looking specifically at that jungle role and the very clear distended impact that that role has on the game right now, I think that you guys are putting a really good uh, foot forward and a really good vote forward for the best one in the league or one who stands out this week at the very least. Yeah, for sure. I think you know, there's a lot of standout performances there from Yuji as well. I'm still pretty high on the Yuji train. Curious to take this into like a, a little bit of a rabbit hole with junglers here because I think my jungler rankings have really gotten shaken up over these last couple of weeks. I think I've gotten a lot higher on Tomio. Uh, that might just be because he gets to have three winning lanes every game, but <laughs> he is looking pretty good. And I'm getting higher and higher on XU. I know it, it, Bonfire's not here to rub it in my face, but XU has been so good along with the rest of Dignitas. Dig was really the surprise to me in that regard in the sense that I was expecting them to be good, but I wasn't expecting expecting them to be top three good. And a lot of that has been on the jungle power that they had. Like Nerko was saying, it's not necessarily on the jungle top synergy or jungle mid synergy, but more so on just the straight up curry potential from the jungler. And that is something that, well, I'm, I'm glad that actually show, showing it because I do think that he wasn't supposed to come down. Like, I, I think that the, the train wreck that was last year shouldn't have put him down back to challenger level. I think that he was still fine enough to in the LCS. And he's really trying to say, I don't want to stay down here anymore. I want to go up. And it's showing really with the performance that they are pulling off. And I do think that as we get deeper into the season and we have more top versus top matchups in terms of not the position, there's a top versus top matchup every game, but top team versus top team matchup is what I mean. I think that we'll get to a point where maybe we'll get back to talking about a little bit about these teams and how they synergize with one another. But if you are able to individually smash jungle, smash mid, smash top, I think that this is really just the brand that is allowing for some of these teams to distinguish themselves from the pack. And right now, I think that it's just going to be a matter of getting an understanding of like how these players participate in a team environment versus how they are individually, if that makes sense. And it's part of the reason why I'm struggling to create an individual tier list for junglers outside the context of their team. Um, I do think that there's a few standouts on that front, but everything past, I would say my top three, top four junglers in the league, all just kind of blend together to me. There's also a clear, I think bottom, but given that CLG faith and fly fam exist in the league, there's always going to be a clear bottom. Yeah, for and sure. The shot goes there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I definitely yeah, I I agree with that. I think it's hard to tell with this few games uh especially with some of the uh some of the teams whose teams have been struggling overall, not just, you know, from the jungle position but coming in from their lanes. Uh I think it's really made it difficult for some players like Sven Skarin to really show anything. Uh, also like I still have a little bit of hope for some of the lanes. Like I think City Witty and Surdy they can cook something up. They show it in the one C TL Faith game that they actually win, uh, where they really find a way to just get Surdy going, and it's enough to win them a whole game. Yeah, it actually did. When you think about it, like obviously, I was I, I wasn't remembering right, but we were talking about it a little bit before going into the pod. The TL first game against Ao. Uh, no, I'm I'm liking this one. A TL first against. Wildcard, yeah, the other the other provisional team, and 
it was a lot on how they enabled not only Sudowiti, but how they enable Surti. If those two are online, it feels like the win conditions for TL first climb that much higher. And I think that that's something that we need to keep on looking for in the future, because even though I don't think their lanes are necessarily bad, they the the or I mean the other lanes aren't necessarily bad mid and bot lane. I do think that they are showcasing that they really really depend on those two players having good time a good time for them to be able to get closer to winning games. Yeah, for sure. Here, so on the subject that we brought up a little bit there, we talked about Dignitas. Uh, five one weeks here for both Dignitas and Evil Geniuses. I have. Uh, you know, I got to eat a little humble pie on the on the Dignitas train, man. I've, Bonfire's not here again, but it, they have really gelled together in a way that I wasn't quite ready for. Um, you know, it's just, I, I expected Insanity to be quite good. I expected uh, for the bot lane to show a lot of success here with Tomo and Diamond just because of the experience they showed. What I didn't really expect was A, XU to impress me as much as he has, uh, and B, for Hoon to really show up here. You know, it's been Hoon in time, guys. The win against Cloud9, Hoon gets to really show some great stuff there on the Fiora. Honestly, thank God that Bonfire isn't here. I mean, I wish him the best. I wish him a speedy recovery from the illness he is currently suffering, which maybe is suffering from success given his called shot. But really, the fact that Dignitas Challengers doesn't even have the excuse from a doubter's mindset where you say, you know, they haven't had hard matchups. I do think that they haven't had the hardest bracket so far, but the fact that they're splitting that series up against C9 Challengers speaks to me that, yeah, I think these guys are going to stick near the top of the rankings, especially given that they are one of the teams with the highest number of games played so far at a full 10. Well, I'm glad that I, with the fact that looking at the standings, I was the second highest on Dixie. So at least I'm not, I'm not on your guys that, that were in, that were kind of doubting them. I'm still up there. So I'm, I'm glad on that one. Thank God. But it's just Dixie is such a run. It feels like they are a random team because even though the players are performing well, I just feel like it's about to burst. Like it's a bubble close to bursting. Not because they are bad, not because it's something like bad is gonna happen or anything like that. But I just, I don't know, Dig, dig the, the organization screams to me that it's going to burst. Something like that. I, I don't know if I put it on the organization <laughs> per se, but I will say they should have lost one of those games to CLG challengers. Uh, yeah, 100% agree. Yeah, the yeah. first game against CLG Challengers, I actually, I was so impressed by CLG's macro it, that it crushes me that they lost it. Like, talking about that first game, I swear, you cannot have the lead that you have with Caitlyn and then 10 minutes later, keep on consistently dying the way that you do. Like, I was begging God for them to lose that game because they didn't deserve that win. I'm going to leave it out like that. They they never deserved that victory against CLG. It's, it, it's, uh, that, that's why you never have faith in CLG, by the way. I, <laughs> I take a slightly more positive spin on it, uh, maybe just because I'm a believer in CLG challengers. <laughs> but I think CLG, like, they have a great macro plan that game because, you know, Look, Meech and Breezy's laning has been rough. Uh, we were a little worried about it in the preseason, and it's been the case so far. Uh, and uh, they're on Varus Ash, and they give a big lead to Tomio's Caitlyn. Uh, and I think they make a great like macro choice to rotate CLG away from the Varus, uh, have Copy just keep control of the mid lane. They, they make a lot of plays towards top to get Meech back in the game. Uh, and they are so set up to properly do it. And then, like, XU steals the Baron, and they make a terrible dragon call, and they just lose the game straight up to a backdoor. I, oh, it just ruins my whole my whole narrative. I was so excited to talk about this game and what a great job CLG did, and instead, they literally just give them the Nexus. Like, half their team is still alive at the dragon when the Nexus dies. Uh, it's so sad that within a bad take that I had, I have another bad take, which is I was actually on the Meech and Breezy hype train. I thought that they were going to be pretty good this season, but I agree. They have disappointed throughout, and I think are one of the weakest parts of CLGC, even though that team still, I think, is doing very well for themselves. Dig does seem a cut above them, a cut above TL as well, and it really is just kind of this weird grouping between them, C9, and maybe Fear, which is the other hot take that I have uh, that 
for the top contenders right now in the league. Um, but for me, I think that's someone else that stands out on Diggs side that I wanted to highlight to a degree, but couldn't do it as a standout player of the week is insanity. Just a stable rock throughout all of this. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, that's fair. I, I will say CLG, I think, has had some tougher than average matchups, right? I mean, they had to they had to split games against uh, Evil Geniuses, uh, and then they lost to Dignitas, but they, they beat their sister team pretty handedly, and they beat FlyQuest, uh... Oh, it was Fly Fam, not Fly Challengers that they played on. So never mind. They haven't had a very de- difficult <laughs> schedule at all. And uh, I'm still not very impressed with Meech and Breezy's laning. So you know what? You're, you're right, Narco. I'm forced to agree with you here. And looking forward, that's probably going to be the point that we are always going to focus with CLG and why probably they are not going to end up being higher is that that building really needs to step it up. Because as we saw, and this can tie up to later points as well, with the meta that is going to be continuously changing, and now that it's rosing closer and closer to more of a bot lane focus with more AD carries that can carry out games, more so than just supportive AD carries, I don't know if I would trust a bot lane that loses with a matchup that I think a lot of people would be willing to take. Like, yes, Caitlyn looks is bothersome, but if you look at how that first game went in in the early stages of the laning with the Ash, uh, Ash Barris, if you play that out better like that lane is the complete opposite but they overcommit they lose it out and they miss out and they mess up a lot for the game for clg in general so i'm i'm really scared for them because that is kind of the point that if they don't change up a lot in the season that's where i think clg will always just stay below the higher higher teams yeah i i actually kind of have the opposite take on where mm-hmm. i think a meta shift will I, I think a meta shift will actually help Meech and Breezy, because I think what uh, what has really been rough for me uh, on these two is their, you know, their laning in particular. But I think outside of it, I think Breezy's got some good uh, abilities to rotate around the map and to make plays happen. And I think Meech, once he gets his farm, is a great team fighter. So it's really, I think, these kind of specific meta scenarios that they struggle with when they're up against the Caitlyn Lux I think they tend to struggle a lot, and I think that's part of the reason that teams are prioritizing Caitlyn Lux into them. Uh, and then I think their own Lucian Nami, when they bring it to the table, has also been quite underwhelming. So I think, you know, if those cease to be such big parts of the meta, and, you know, you can put Meech on stuff that maybe scales a little bit more, I think they'll be better from the bot lane in that way. 13.1 be incoming, guys. Get excited. We're finally going to get a shakeup. I pray. That's what I'm hoping for, at least as well. But And, and not to overshadow uh, the other team that also went 5-1, and one, which is Evil Geniuses. You know, nobody had a perfect week, but Dig and EG came damn close. And it's got to really be uh, mostly on the back of Shaden. I mean, they played the same draft like five games uh, here. But, you know, with two subs still having a performance like that, I, I think that's commendable. So I, I do think that the fact that the two subs are still such a prevalent matter for EG, and it feels like the, the only team that it's a prevalent thing remaining because the others have gotten some of their players back. I think the only other one is uh, Fly C with with their support i think it's the only other one if i'm not wrong that that isn't full yeah I that so. yeah that isn't close to full. not winsome yeah exactly because they're like we uh, we were talking about this right like tsm already has their support the side of uh, gg now can actually have young because gory is, is now on the main uh, gg team and the other teams have also kind of settled with their starting players same with 100c even though that's another topic so the fact that they still another week with subs were able to perform now in a really high manner at least gives me more hope with the newer team. Like having more consistent players, obviously someone that will consistently be good in Ryoma, because even though he probably isn't higher ever, he certainly is really good for what the challenger scene can showcase. And I think that with having another rock, especially if Soul doesn't come back, is going to be really, really good for the performance of EG. But that also leads me to my other point where I'm worried because I still don't think Soul is performing and that's one of the players that I was really hyping up. And his performance is making me doubt quite heavily that if it doesn't show and EG's results doesn't improve much higher, then they could look to that particular position to try and change. 
Yeah, in, in Seoul's slight defense, you know, I mentioned they played the same draft like five games in a row here, and it largely yep. involved Seoul ending up on Sejuani. Like, he played... How many games of Sejuani did that guy play? He played f- I think four, four no. games of Sejuani this week, one game of Cassante, and, and one game of Fiora, which was the game they lost. So I agree, he's looked rough on the, the, the kind of expected carry champions, uh, he also didn't look great on the Cassante, but I think it's it's hard to show out really uniquely on Sejuani when your job is just to enable Shaden. But I agree. I, I hope to see more from Sol, and maybe having the full roster will kind of unlock that a little bit more. And for me, it is just about unlocking that full roster that I think keeps me from really passing judgment on EG. The fact that they're doing so well without subs is both a blessing and a curse because I don't really know as someone who is only now trying to enfranchise themselves with the LCS and NA scene in general, how these players are going to fare if, in fact, these subs couldn't be a boost and they're what's keeping Evil Geniuses kind of tied in record with some of these other teams in that, like, third fourth fifth position but there is a chance that they can still develop and pop off and i do think tds that soul is someone that i'm gonna have to keep my eye on regarding how they develop from here on out but given the upcoming changes in the meta i don't think that it would be terrible for them to just be on that sejuani duty for the time being and just continue to perform as not necessarily a playmaker but just as a really nice kind of stable lane for them to continue to you know, develop other players through. As it currently stands, I don't really see it as a gaping hole, just not one of the bright spots. Yeah. And that that kind of leads me to the next topic I wanted to talk about here. So who do we have as real contenders to win the NACL in our minds at this point? As we're about a third of the way into the season, a lot of teams have played 10 games those that haven't have played eight games uh that's out of the 30 games they're going to be playing total so we've kind of seen most of the teams at least against a a fair section of the competition who do we think at this point in time really has a shot to win it all if i were to just be straight on the sports betting train it's got to be one of the top ranked teams right now. It being kind of split between Dignitas and Cloud9. Both of them have their own kind of sample size with Dig having more games played. And I know Bonfire will cheer for me saying this, but I do think that Dig look exceptionally consistent. The question is, can Cloud9 peak higher throughout the rest of the season? It's kind of the main question, right? Like, will this be what cloud nine can reach the highest or will they get better and better because that's also a thing that happens in other leagues right like teams peak at a time at times and you want to peak at the right times not peak earlier than later because later is when it matters the most for the championship so it's gonna be interesting to see if cloud nine keeps on getting better and not only that to me now we also need to keep on taking the consideration of will a team try and take someone from cloud nine challengers because as we always know, and as it always happens, if someone is not playing up to standard in the LCS, they come down there, they grab a player, they put it in and hope that things get better. And MNS could do the job for a lot of these teams that are lacking mid laners and that are desperate. Because one thing that MNS had has that a lot of LCS orcs like he's Korean. So they would be willing to go for him if they if they are thinking of a, of a changing a mid laner. By the way, IMT, I'm looking at them. Be careful because that may be the place. I I mean, I'm I'm kind of on the IMT swapping out mid laners train, but I I don't think Cloud9 is parting with MNS at this point in not. time unless they can get a, a sizable buyout for him. I do think, you know, Diplex has looked good in week one, so that kind of dampens my, my beliefs in, in an MNS LCS appearance. But... I still think they're going to want to hold on to that player for at least a little bit longer unless they get a serious offer. But anyway, I agree with the Cloud9 and Dignitas rankings as contenders. I do think I'm at a point where I'm willing to... I'm, I'm at least... I'm edging towards being willing to put uh, Evil Geniuses Challengers up there as well, given this last week. I'm still really high on King and Ryoma. I think they're going to come in 
take their places and be some of the better players in their roles in the league. Uh, and that's a substantial upgrade to a team that's already six and four. And I think just came off of a really good week. Uh, it's going to make them more flexible. It's really going to enable them to carry from more positions. I, I think they're going to be right up there with these guys. And I must say, because I do agree with the AGC that they probably can take it higher, but I still think, and I'm still writing the fact that I think TLC is going to be a contender. Like, they have been one of those teams that feels like they are in the line, right? In the Like, they are not super highlighty or something like that like it's not an exci in the point where they are exaggeratedly good or super highly good but they are also not bad so they are in a point where they don't where they are just passing by and i think that they are going to come up surprising by the time the the season is coming to its end and i think some of the players are really meshing well enough together they have gotten into certain ties and all that but i think the the korean players have kind of gotten accustomed uh, well enough at this point to what teal is probably looking for and i think the soul laners have really been playing well like i am i will i will say it again i am high on apa i think he can be the best mid laner but bradley has been looking really really good in my eyes like i think he's one of the best performing players so far even though we didn't put him obviously in the top of the league like to me he has been one of the best performing players so far in the league and for TL, if tlc has been one of the better players as well I would like to say that TL is sitting there in my top three, top four, but for me, I do have to withhold judgment on them just because I feel that when we talk about teams with easy brackets so far, they're one of those people who just hasn't had to show out against C9, against EG. I already do think that there are a few kind of bright spots for them. I agree. I think Bradley looks fantastic, but I want to see Bradley against some of these really top tier top laners in the league. And it feels like when there has been pressure topside, when they're up against some of these more prominent players, such as Faisal on fear in that opening day, they still ended up splitting that series. And that's what really worries me. The one, one versus fear, the one, one versus immortals makes me think that once the going gets tough, they could stop their role yeah for sure and I, i'm not even so much as worried about bradley as i am worried about like the mirror just dive bot gank bot game plan i know a lot of teams are, are mostly just ganking bot at level three all the time nowadays but uh you know i i don't know i maybe it's just because i was a mirror hater coming into the season but i'm still like not crazy sold on mirror and kim down as these like I think they've both looked better than I expected, but I'm not sold on them as, like, the caliber of players uh, that can take you to competing with, like, a Dignitas or a Cloud9. What say you, TDS? Any defense for TL? Oh, no, I'm, like, I'm, my, my <laughs> argument is still for later on in the season, so for now, I'm, I, like, I, I think they are there. It's right, just a matter of when. Sounds let's good. put it on the shelf as many things currently still stand i gotta yeah. have i have like four or five called shots at this point hanging out looks like this sort of damocles over my head right now so you know we'll, we'll shelve this one for you tds i will just bookmark it here do we really need to bookmark more things for me like honestly with the flies <laughs> thing is still like on my back i'm just feeling more and more dumb the longer the season goes with that one so yeah well one fly quest doing far better than the other fly quest but i want to talk about the the quote unquote good provisional teams right not to not to dump on on all of the rest here uh but particularly fear and wild card it's looking like at this point in the season uh that they will be the two dodging relegation not locked in stone by any means uh you know somebody like aoe could potentially make a run uh especially if some of us are, are haters on these two teams but I want to talk about where we're at on these two in particular, just because they've they've overperformed our expectations by so much, and I feel like neither has had this huge drop off in week two. Like, yeah, Wildcard lost some games, but I still like have them substantially higher than where they started. Yeah, I think that all of us still, especially when you average out all of our picks, have these provisional teams, you know, not really beating out a substantial number of these uh, more established challenger teams. I think that at the very most, we had a few knocking down Golden Guardians who, frankly, don't even really look like the worst of the established challenger teams right now, which is a crazy thing. 
So the fact that we're having Fear and Wildcard both leapfrogging over so many other contenders really impresses me. And I think that I'm happy to say that while they aren't making a run for the championship, they will be dodging relegation pretty easily. Another team I do want to throw my uh, hat in the ring for and just see how you guys feel about it is, I will say, I think AOE has some fight in them. They haven't had the best record so far, but they have had one of the harder brackets up until this point. And I think that they, in every game, even the ones that they're dropping, show levels of fight that you just don't see out of the other provisionals. And I hope AOE are able to perform because I did have my highest belief on them. I thought they were going to be the team that will be able to perform the better out of the provisional teams. But I feel like they, they have been really averaged. Whereas you can see that wildcard, maybe it was overperformance the way that it started for them. But at the same time, I think that they have been performing, like, like even in some games that they have lost, they still perform really well. They still are trying to go for a style that it seems like it's been established for them with some of the different picks that they try out and the fact that they do put some of the pressure in some of their lanes. So it seems like they are at least are staying, is staying close to true to what they originally were playing with. And I think that that's still great to see. The fear thing, I think it's the one most interesting because initially I wasn't really considering it on the fact that the things that were happening behind the scenes, right? Like I still wanted to see it on the players and I had no hope for the players, if I'm honest. But the fact of the matter is that the players are playing really well and are performing really well as a team. So maybe it actually just came out to the fact that they united over the fact that things were shitty behind the scenes and they are trying to either get out as fast as possible and the best way to do that is to actually perform or they really think that the, the, this or this team has hope for the future and they want to just do the best possible and they are doing that. Like I think Fear has been performing really well. Do you think that the accelerationist approach to trying to get out, as you put it, TDS, as fast as possible, is to just tank and go for relegation? No, no, no. I mean, to be good. <laughs> That's I... way easier. Yeah, just be good. And then just be good. Every, everything exactly. will be a lot easier if you're just If good. you're good, you're paid more. And if you're paid more, you're probably in LCS. So that's fine. See, everything works out. That's true. I think, yeah, fears continued to impress me into this week. I think uh, there were... Some, still some good games out of Faisal, but I think some of the other folks showed up and actually impressed me this week. There was uh, a couple of really good games from uh, Minui. He did really well on uh, the Varus in particular up against uh, FlyFam. Uh, not the hardest of competition, but still I think had a solid performance for himself in there. Uh, and a huge casting game out of Shochi against Immortals. I think both... Uh, really showed up really well, and they were not the players uh, I think that I was really excited for on Fear in Week 1. In Week 1, it was a lot more about Faisal, and it was a lot more about Trevor, and it was a lot more about uh, about Perry. I mean, it was all of them, and uh, it really kind of the opposite this week, I thought. I agree. I don't think that this was the hardest week for Fear, and the fact that they split that series versus Immortals does worry me for them keeping as high of a standing as they currently have but the fact that they're dumpstering fly fam with ease is you know the lowest of bars to clear but i still think that these are games where we sh see different dimensions of play from them and it shows a level of diversity that i think some other provisional teams are struggling with to a degree and one of those things that i want to talk about regarding that flexibility is on wild card i know gordo you in particular had a lot of doubts regarding how this team was going to play once their cheese was figured out to a degree especially for moose hater and i think that this is a week where moose hater is kind of facing his reckoning to a degree uh not that he is doing terribly but i do think that in terms of that dynamic i do put fear as firmly the best provisional team because wild card is faltering and looks slightly more mortal yeah, the, the getting 2 owed by TSM uh, was really rough for me. I thought they looked much better uh, against TL Faith, although, or TL First, rather. Uh, I mean, how not too hard to look better versus TL First, though. And even then, they still lose a game to a, to a sturdy pop-off on Cassante. And the series against TSM, I think, really does expose Moose Hater really bit. In particular, I, I gotta be mad at that game number two, uh, and then combine that with the game number two against, uh, TL first as well. Because, because, can Moose Hater just not play regular champs? Uh, because, a uh, a strange champion pool and a deep champion pool are not necessarily the exact same thing. 
uh his camille looked pretty rough and that game number two against tsm i just cannot get over like what's wrong with like Cassante, man or fiora like they're in a situation haunts are blind picks renekton nar and Jax are both banned and every top laner in the world just picks fiora there but uh moose hater goes illawi and it, it does allow things and they lose the game i'm just i don't know i'm i'm getting a little upset about it there as someone who just e-subbed yesterday and had to play lilia support i i will defend off meta i will defend moose haters honor i think that the fact he's hanging as well as he is on these champions speaks to a very high ceiling for him to develop into. Maybe his Camille doesn't look great right now, but if you get a coach around him to yell at him to not pick a Lowey in the future, I do think that he has like a lot of time to develop, right? This is what this league is for. And sure, maybe right now these meta choices aren't the best things that he's displaying his skill on. But I think that even if he ultimately has everything fall down on his head and he realizes he can't go Garen top or allow top in the future, I think that he's going to be able to bounce back exceptionally well. We still have quite a bit of the season to go through. I will say, taking advice from someone that picked off uh, Lilia's support, even if you're off rolling, feels like a little bit of a grain of salt you have to take with just saying <laughs> it's so good guys radiant virtue is broken right now you build full tank you can rush frozen hard on her you flash into the middle of them you qr and you've already done more than like 80 percent of the supports in the game it's so we good do not condone this in solo queue by the way <laughs> no, that's those are the champions i want to build radiant virtue on the ones with prerequisites to press their alt button that's yeah <laughs> I got a banger dive under tower. You guys can go watch that, you know? Okay. So, did we lose the first game in 23 minutes? Yes, but I was on Lulu that one. We had a better second game when I switched over to Bard ADC Lilia support. So just saying, off meta does things. Off meta does. Poor diff. Yeah. <laughs> it was. I, I was gapping him, man. Diff. Under tier two diving <laughs> QRW. It was so good, man. Absolutely clean on my part. Uh yeah, I, I suppose so there. The only other thing I would say on the uh, provisional teams in particular, especially because we were just talking about wildcard versus TL first, Surdy with the big pop-off on Cassante up against wildcard and just a really solid week from him all around. Uh, you know, I came into this season saying that I thought Surdy was probably the best individual player on a provisional team. Uh, and I think, if anything, that was kind of underselling it. I mean, I think Surdy is one of the better top laners in this league uh, and should really be respected as such. I'm excited to see him back on a Challengers team before too long because he's playing far too well to, to not end up there. I think I actually, when I was talking, uh, by the way, when I was talking about Soul, I was thinking about Surdy, just, just to put it out there. If something happens... If something happens weirdly in the middle of the season, I'm just saying. <laughs> Evil Genius's challengers want take backsies. Yeah. <laughs> like really desperately from Team Liquid and just get back 30. Hey, that I, I won't take it away from any team to do anything because we're in an A. Okay? This is an A. <laughs> anything can happen. You know, usually that's like has a positive spin on it. <laughs> not, yeah. not like all the teams are gonna crumble and replace all their players, but <laughs> That's the most depressing American dream I've ever heard, Gordo. That's all I gotta say. Anybody can be replaced at any time. That's the that's the real American dream. All right, let's let's move on to uh, la last topic about this week in particular, which is uh, some of our later arrivals to the league. Uh, players who started off this week uh, or are about to come in this next week. I want to just hear some takes here on Balulu, King Rioma, Rocks 908, and maybe Winsome as well. Just uh, we've talked about King and Rioma a lot, so maybe skip over them. But what what about our thoughts on the others? We'll go first, then, because first of all, I hate the fact that it's Rocks 908. Like <laughs> uh, it just it just irks me in a way that I cannot explain it. But it, it's how it is. I will not go against it. Is it is it the numbers? Yeah, it's literally the numbers. It's, I... it's the part that just... I can't. But there's plenty of players with numbers. Duo King is Duo King 1. Duo just King saying. Duo King 1. I, I, love, I, I love that these guys are keeping that tradition alive. I want to... Someday I want to do a, uh, a version of the Bob Emergency, but I want it to just be about esports players with numbers in their names. Uh, <laughs> I think... You know, 
the thing that, that the thing is that it always reminds me of that Overwatch com commercial with Crusher 99. Like the, it just makes me think <laughs> always about that, and I'm just like, like yes, but no. <laughs> it just sounds so so wrong in so many levels. But I do want to say though that Rocks had a really good debut on on TSM. But like, if I'm not wrong, it's the first two old TSM gets, so already go it goes to show a good debut. But the thing is, it, it reminds me a lot of something that does happen quite a bit in football, where like it's kind of a saying, but I'm not sure if it's a saying, but it's kind of a thing that does happen that whenever you replace a coach in football, they, they the first game they play, they win. And that's kind of what happened with TSM. The first game that they bring on the, the their actual player, they win not only that game, that series. And they win well. I thought TSM played well that first series. But then they came back to being TSM. And it just, I'm not sure what to expect from the rest of the team. The bot lane is still looking like probably the weakest part because I do understand that the mid lane was an issue both before and now but it is a young player so it's kind of a uh, you you have to give him the leeway in that regard because he can steal the ball up but wild turtle is not a young player and he, he's not looking that good yeah well like eventually i think tsm challenger still intends to bring in drag coup longer term whenever they can who by the way i was just looking at this on the wiki whose first name is dragon by the way so that, that's in pretty cool life? yeah uh but whatever they bring him over, Ow. I mean, and Wild Turtle gets to play with his third support this season and run it down for them as well. <laughs> I I just I can't imagine that's going to change too much of uh of how TSM's been doing. I will say I think Doxus looks pretty good, but I I really wonder. I, I'm doubting that the problem in the bot lane is the supports. I mean. I'm not going to slander support for another week, actually. It is just not in me to continue to court controversy in that way. But I will touch on Rox908 one last time. I think that, like, it's he's fine. It's good that we are seeing things solidify a little bit in the league. I think that's what I want more than anything, that I don't have to do another we didn't start the fire variation on Twitter. But <laughs> as it currently stands, I think that I am relatively impressed with tsm this week i don't think that i will define their trajectory through this league as a collapse in the way that i can say immortals has just permanently disappointed from minute one but we'll see maybe Bululu will do something there as well just tweetly you don't need to slander supports i can slander them for you that's fine i i, I don't know i thought Bululu's looked solid i mean he didn't turn the whole team around overnight but i thought his first game in was uh was pretty impressive the one on the zoe i believe yeah, it was right. yeah he had a really good zoe game just to start things off he's been picking weird crap as well though man i do i have to give the same kind of if i'm gonna throw doubt on moose hater i have to throw doubt on my boy balulu as well like He's got Twisted Fate games in there. He's got Velikaz games in there. Like, can you play some, play some regular champions so I can properly compare you to your peers, man? I mean, it's such a sad day where we say, oh my gosh, please don't play Twisted Fate. What a terrible, unstable mid laner. It truly really is sad. Also, you know, I think the Velikaz pick was interesting. It's better than the fact that, you know, CLG Faith are continuing to have to deal with the Xerath one trick that is Saranok, but, you know, that's beside the point anyway. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't I, I don't want to sound like a like I hate on all off meta picks, but I just feel like what it's like when you're playing different weird stuff every game, it becomes very hard to evaluate you. And I can't imagine it's like a good resume for LCS either. Uh, but I mean, I guess, especially if you're just starting out, if you're just starting out here like Moose Hater, you're just looking to cement yourself and prove that you can compete. So I'll almost give him a little bit more leeway. Uh, Balulu is coming in having played for forever uh, and is probably trying to compete for a starting spot. Uh, I wish he would show that he could play the meta picks that a blaze olive is failing on uh, rather than that. You have to build all of your drafts around his weird pool. Isn't that kind of thing though? The fact that like, and this isn't in any way an attack, but because the entry level for his team, for his LCS team seems to be low. Like as long as he's not inting legitimately i think that he has a really good shot at coming up into the lcs like like, like i'm saying it's not a shot at a place to live or anything but he's not performing well at all and i think that 
that at least for Bolulu just shows that if you're better than bad, you're you should be at least thought about. Yeah, and I, don't get me wrong. I, if a Blaze Olive doesn't step it up, I do think we're gonna see Bolulu in the LCS at some point this split. Um, but that like that's just what that's what just baffles me even more though, because it's like why would you, when you show up here, you would just think logically you like want to show off on meta picks to earn yourself that promotion. And I think if anything gives them pause about that, when a Blaze Olive, if a Blaze Olive continues to look poor. Uh, it's going to be because Balulu just keeps playing all this weird stuff. You know the weirdest part of that? Like, yeah, I think it more, you really think that if I'm going to use secret picks, I would use them against teams that are probably going to be better. Not necessarily against teams that I think I can beat them with regular stuff, right? Like, that's kind of the, the way that I would approach the logic. So, yeah, Balulu feels really weird in that instance, but I do think that Balulu does make IMT a bit better at least. Oh, yeah. I think he's one of the lesser problems that that team has because they have a lot. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I I think they looked a little better this week. I think Chad and ADD looked a little bit... I, honestly, I think everybody looked a little bit better, but maybe that's just because they were finally able to get some wins on the board. Um, uh, true. You know, it, I say some wins on the board, like they didn't go two and four, but, you know, they had, like... In their wins, I think everybody looked... Uh, a little bit better and I think even in their losses they looked less terrible than last week's losses ADD in particular I thought had a pretty embarrassing week one and I think hard to not bounce back from that but he did um only other player I'd want to consider here is Winsome who maybe is showing up next week it's not really it's probably based on whatever Ayla shows up to be on FlyQuest proper um because Kitong is still considered the temporary sub here, and I, I think Winsome looked good at LCS, so I'm kind of excited to see how he could level up this Fly Challengers team. Actually, I think it's this, because yes, but at the same time, you're playing you're playing with Prince. I don't think you had to do that much when you're playing with potentially the best AD carry in the league. Like, I still think that it's between him and Berserker, but you're playing with potentially the best AD carry in the league. I don't think you had to do much, if I'm honest. Sure, sure. But I, I think, you know, Kitong is is new to this level. Masu is also new to this level. I think, you know, they wanted the kind of veteran rookie dynamic going on there. Uh, not that Winsome's this tremendous veteran either, but I, I would think that they want to enable, uh, that, that could at least enable Masu a little bit more because I think Kitong has struggled in parts. Is Masu still playing on ping, by the way? Ooh. That's a good question. I do not know if Masu is still playing on ping. I haven't heard any memes about Masu playing on ping this week, but I don't know if that's because yeah. they're not funny anymore uh, or if it's because he's not playing on ping. Or because his FlyQuest is not doing that bad either. <laughs> yeah, true. He looks all right. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. He, he, I, I think a lot. I don't think he looks like he's making mechanical mistakes. I think, if anything, it just looks like it's, uh, it's kind of tough in the bot lane for him. Well, let's... Uh, Let's take a step back here and talk about NACLQs over the weekend a little bit. Um, just curious to hear some takes. TDS and I covered Team Ambition all weekend. Uh, Nyarko was covering Duyin Tony Top all weekend. Uh, any any takes that you guys come away from that event with? I have actually, like, I have two things that I want to say. First of all, that Dojin thing was such a roller coaster. Like, <laughs> Dojin Tony Top was such a roller coaster to actually be heard about because they win, they lose, they win, they lose. It, it was so funny to see. And I'm sorry for Chaco because it felt like you were like you were having a hard time as well. But it was fun to see. Yeah, I think Dojin Tony Top is actually one of the standout teams to talk about. So I was lucky I was casting them. Standout, not necessarily because they are living up to expectations. They were the third seed coming into the NECL qualifiers. But because, holy mackerel, did these guys play absolutely unhinged League of Legends throughout the entirety of the weekend. The back-to-back -back losses, game two, game three, scared the pants off of me because that meant that the last two games were nail biters. But they basically just flipped every game as to either being very, very strong wins or very, very crushing losses. Um, even in their third game, they were rocking a 10,000 gold lead at one point. They just managed to like throw it off of really, really good play from Sea Dogs, frankly. Incredible teleport from their mid lane during an Elder Dragon fight to flank and absolutely decimate them. But 
for me, I think that what I'm worried about for DTT as they move into this uh, playoff stage is that they need to be able to, you know, bring victories back to back <laughs> to break through these uh, best of threes and best of five series in the future. And I don't know how they can do that when they show very, very high highlights in high levels of play, but otherwise occasionally just absolutely run it down. Yeah. Other thing to consider here. So Maryville comes out of the OQ with the highest seed at five and zero um, I guess technically making themselves and you know an early favorite for the tournament, the highest seed coming in to the group stages at least. And now I, I gotta wonder, like, what happens with a collegiate team making it kind of into NACL, uh, the relegation tournament, if if Maryville does manage to make it top four at the end of the day, which I think based on at least this first showing, it seems very very possible. Um, it's going to be interesting to see like what a collegiate roster in an, an ACL kind of situation would end up looking like. Yeah, especially with all of the CLO, uh scheduling mishaps and clashes that we had in that first week. Hopefully that stuff gets sorted out. It, it actually makes me begin thinking because like you're pointing out, if they do get out there, like what does that kind of mean for the NA scene? Because there is separation between what what is the challenger circuit the amateur circuit or that and c lol like there's been quite a separate between the two of them but at the same time like i think amateur circuit is what it's supposed to be considered a collegiate scene when you think traditional sports because that's the pathway to pro that's a step below pro if i'm not wrong over there uh, so if that's the case i think that it would make sense to see a collegiate team in the nacl but I think it would kind of make it so that people have to reconsider what we, what the approach, the, the actual approach to pro should be, and how they make it happen, because that would be like the first, first bit. Kind of thing. There's no, no recollection at to this point where a collegiate team has played in any sort of tournament to qualify to or to be closer to the LCS. I don't think I've seen any. Oliver was talking about this on Twitter, I think, earlier today, actually, and I think he makes a very interesting point that Maryville is just a strata above every college. And so even though I think this is a nice precedent to be set, I like the idea of collegiate being a more viable option for aspiring pros, just because I think for future reasons, it allows for people to just have more stable livelihoods when they come out of the pro scene after so many years playing League of Legends professionally or any other esport. But the question is is Maryville just such an extreme outlier that this doesn't actually do a whole lot to turn things around and actually change the environment as much as it is just demonstrate the extent to which Maryville has enfranchised themselves to a degree that other colleges have not been able to and this also goes a, a, a little bit with what I think it's also conflicting in the NA scene because they are playing this off in a really or well League of Legends in general plays it off in a way in a way that it contrasts the actual like na sports scene because for me at least it's not weird to see this happen because this is how football works in in general like you never or at least in general see a player that is required to go through college like for in football in football players debut at 16 years old or 15 years old even there, there's cases for that you don't need to be an actual graduate, like a collegiate graduate, to actually play, be able to play in sports. Meanwhile, in the U.S., you have to. Like, you cannot uh, be a professional player in NFL, in NBA, in baseball, if I'm not wrong, to debut, if I'm not wrong. No, you can go straight through for NBA. LeBron is a very notable example. Of oh, okay. I thought the college. rules have changed since LeBron, Ye though. Yeah. I think you have to play has some it? collegiate now. I thought, like, LeBron was the last one. I, yeah. I don't know about hmm. the case for MLB, though. I know NFL, you do need to play collegiate. I think yeah. NBA, you do. That's kind well. of a thing. Like, I'm not sure on that, but that's kind of a thing. That's why I think, and that's also why I think, like, any soccer, well, any football, soccer, is not to the same degree as in general, because you have to wait to actually be able to debut compared to the rest of the world, where if you're 16 years old, you debut. It doesn't matter if you are... are, are a coll uh, collegiate athlete or not, you can debut straight to the first team if you're good enough. And that's something that I think it's conflicting with NA because like it, they have the approach of the NA, scene, of NA sports, 
but at the same time, they are also playing it off as the normal rest of the world sports. And I think that's conflicting in and of itself because they don't know where to really position itself, uh, themselves in. I think this is a conversation for a much, much general kind of topic because I think that it's kind of conflicting and like until they decide on something like that, like the, ta the talent pipeline is kind of hard to really be sure where to look into. Yeah. I, I just think it's going to be really interesting if they end up taking that CL spot just because they will be run they would be run so differently than every other provisional team in CL yeah. you know you can't like pick up a free agent and be like all right you got to enroll at this university now you know it's just not the same kind of uh, deal that's going on with a lot of these places and to reach really far into the future Talking about potential teams making it all the way to the NACL from these qualifiers, what do you think relegation looks like? What do you think will happen to these teams that are kind of competing under par in the NACL right now? Fly Fam, I think TL First to a degree, CLG Faith, unfortunately for me. That was, that, that's actually something that I was thinking about when, when looking at the relegation. Do teams or do LCS teams have to focus on their subsidiary teams as well like do they are, are they forced to commit to them because i can see them just saying if they if it's not the case if some of them get relegated like okay someone take them and we just don't care about them anymore yeah i mean like, if they get relegated for that? Bit, they i mean it's up to them if they just they could disband the team or they could compete in the qualifiers the next split if they want to keep it and that's kind of that's kind of the thing with me. If 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 that's the case, like I feel like it kind of beats the purpose because they still are not really taking it fully, fully, fully into like into seriousness. For the teams though that should be qualifying, I think it's such a hard thing to say because since I think both they need to play both qualifiers before actually getting to the point where they go to the final like final battle between the teams that will be relegated or and not. Like a lot of those teams may end, one of those teams may end up just getting completely boomed. I think Team Fishtaco is one that I'm looking at to get completely boomed. Not necessarily because of problems inside of it, but because their players are not really... Like, some of them, I don't think they are going to be staying there for long. It's you're what you're saying they're just going to get picked apart by other challenger teams looking for subs and stuff. Potentially, particularly because they have Elorim and Dardo. Like the Once again, they are proven LCS players. I can see a team that needs quick fixes to just take them away. And that's it. Yeah. It's definitely a risk uh, that can happen. I know roster lock will hit at some point. So I know. Uh, okay. I remember this is the first thing I was asking when they announced this format, right? Is uh, if if Fly Fam is 16th, you know, if they're in last place and FlyQuest wants to keep three spots uh, or two spots in the NACL, uh, can they just swap the Fly Challengers roster in? <laughs> to play in the relegation tournament and the, uh, the answer is no there will be a roster lock occurring uh, a couple weeks before that point but a couple weeks before playoffs i believe is is when it happens so you can't save yourself from getting sent to relegation either but the team can still get broken up before relegation yeah absolutely that's kind that of can definitely risk. happen especially for these yeah. amateur teams right the ones that aren't even in an acl and, uh, and don't have those major league affiliations and I, I don't know that it's necessarily um, a surprise that the the teams that look like they're at risk of relegation are the, uh, particularly the CLG and FlyQuest affiliates, just because I feel like these rosters were built differently than how you would think a provisional roster would be run. And I think it's because of their status as, as these affiliates, right? AOE and Cincy Fear and Wildcard in particular, these are teams like built to win. These were the most competitive rosters they could put together to try to retain their spot. Um, built off of you know the bones of AOE Ginger Turmeric and the main AOE roster and Cincinnati Fear being plucked from kind of the remnants. Um, the uh, these rosters, you know, they have like really kind of risky decisions that they've made. You know, Bashani and Saranok coming straight out of collegiate without having accomplished much in amateur. Um, Lunasia having barely played outside of the, uh, having barely played at the amateur level at all, really, other than in some scrims with 100 Thieves next. I think it's not a surprise that they end up towards the bottom because they took like an even riskier approach than most of the challenger teams are taking when the challenger teams, you know, they have no risk. They can get last place and still be, um, 
you know, they can still be in the league. And I, I kind of want to take it because uh, there's something that I, uh, like I was looking at some of the tweets or like conversations in some of the servers and I actually got reminded of Samudo. I, uh, I wanted to bring it up because I was thinking why Samudo wasn't over like in any team. Uh, like I thought someone was kind of missing. Samudo seemed like a player that should be in, in the ch in the challenger circuit or challenger scene. And it's interesting seeing that he was apparently just boot camping or is apparently boot camping in Korea. And it's kind of fun to see how he can improve over there. But it also kind of tells me that probably some of the options that a, a couple of these teams could have taken into account are weren't available because things like this. And I'm kind of curious if that also put a damper into some of the team plannings. And that's why some of the rosters ended up being more like lackluster than they could have been in a sense. Yeah. Zamudo studying under LS over in Korea was super interesting to me as well. I do wonder what kinds of offers he declined in order to do that. Um, you know, was he getting challengers offers? Probably not. You would probably choose to do that. Did he get provisional team offers? I'm not 100% sure on that either, especially because some of these uh, top laners look pretty good. Maybe, you know, somebody like Flyfam or somebody would rather have had Zamudo. Um, but I wonder if, like, if he declined uh, provisional team offers because he is so young that True. if he, uh, you know, he might think that he can get directly onto a challenger's team you know, the way that somebody like Sniper kind of has. And I don't know that he'd be wrong. You know, he's he is very good and very young. So I wonder if that's kind of the goal where it's just like, I just want to go straight to challengers. I don't really care what's going on in amateur right now. Uh, I think I proved myself on AOE and now I just need to get the job. And in the same way, you could kind of look at it as trying to, like, obviously I'm not implying that this is connection-based or anything like that, but if you have the backing of someone of LS's name, like, even if he's, uh, like, a contested personality in the scene, he's still a personality that everyone knows of. So having his backing is still quite good for a lot of teams. Like, not even just challenger teams. If actual LCS teams see that someone of a high name is backing him up and saying that he's a really talented player and all that, like, that can even boost him even higher. And I think that that also can go into the question. Because, like, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I, it's something that I've thought about as well. Like, if I got recommendation or backing from someone that it's really important, like, I feel like that sometimes overlaps just a straight up playing for a lesser team. Because it can happen, like, with, for example, like, a name, a quick name on, on one of these teams without trying to, like, attack anyone or anything like that. Like, NXI was looking like someone really hypey. But his stacks or his stocks are kind of falling down because he's stuck on a team that is not going to accomplish anything, looking like one of the har harshest teams to look at. Meanwhile, if he keeps getting that experience under the wing of someone that is known, I, I think that that can also just impact his career in a more positive manner. And I think that that also impacted his move. Very fair. Very possible. Uh, wonder if we'll we'll find that out eventually. Um that's about it for NACL Qs and NA Amateur. We'll definitely talk about that more, especially as we start to get towards the relegation at the end of the split. Definitely we'll have some whole episodes about that. But for now, just to look forward to uh, to next week, a couple of exciting matches here. Uh, FlyQuest versus CLG, one that really stands out to me as uh, as one that I think will kind of solidify the like upper middle of the league, right? I think they're both just outside of that contender status uh and I i'm really curious to see them face off against each other i hope that flyquist loses so that they can at <laughs> least get closer to my <laughs> ranking because i'm tired uh, like uh, the more i look at it the dumber it feels and we come full circle <laughs> <laughs> yeah no c9 okay. versus 100 thieves gonna be another one next week that'll be that i'm at least gonna be paying attention to i still i'm kind of at the point in my life where i think cloud nine is just gonna slam everybody um, I think everybody on Cloud9 looks like a little bit better than expected, uh, and that's making things look very dangerous. But, you know, 100 Thieves was still our preseason first seed, so we, we got to give them at least a little bit of credit. Let's see if they can uh, take a game off Cloud9 see. here. You know, actually, TDS, I I'm with you. Uh, I'm rooting for FlyQuest Challengers to lose a match next week, and that's going to be their one against CLG Faith. I'm praying, man. It's gonna like. Here's my called shot. This is the bar I'm setting for favorite team in the league. 
they are going to take a single game off of a team that is in the top 10 out of 16. That is my hope. That is, that I will be happy if they can do that. And, you know, if it happens next week versus Fly Challengers, I will be happy as a clam. I remember you were saying, like, statistically, there, there should be an opportunity for CLG fam to pull it off. But I don't think statistics matter when your team is bad. <laughs> This isn't a statistics thing, TDS. I think you're misunderstanding. This is straight from the thing. heart as an unabashed fan of CLG Faith. Not a series dub. They're going to have to split. I'm telling you that much. But they will be able to beat one team for one game, and it's going to be a solid 30 minutes of glory. This show goes off the damn rails by the time it gets late enough in the night and we're almost <laughs> done here. For for reference, we record this after Risen Divine League, so this this goes this gets late into the night. And I think we've officially started to lose it a little bit here. I think that's as good a spot as any to call it on the show for this week. But thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, thank you all for, for parsing through however many bits of this I've had to cut out. Uh, and I'm surprised we didn't touch on 100C at all, if I'm honest. We I kind know, of let them go. There's so many freaking teams, man. It's We'll get to 100 Challengers next week. There's so many teams in this league. We're going to miss some. kind of irrelevant just because of how eh they have been. True, 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 true. Well, like, we'll check I in. They Maybe they the take premier. a game off of Cloud9 Challengers this week, and then we have a little bit of something to talk about. Until then, 16 more games of NACL this weekend. Make sure to tune in, and we will uh, see you guys next week to break it down.